Israel attacked an Iranian cargo vessel again, this time in the Red Sea as opposed to the one last month in the Mediterranean Sea. According to the New York Times, Israel has already informed the United States that its forces had targeted the Iranian ship Saviz in the Red Sea. In this context, the unnamed American official who spoke to the New York Times said that the Israelis consider this attack as a retaliation for what they called the previous Iranian strikes that had targeted Israeli ships. To add more drama to the matter, the Israelis claimed that there had been a delay in their attack to allow the American aircraft carrier in the region, Dwight D. Eisenhower, to remain at a safe distance from the Iranian ship, which Israel claims is a military one. The damage to the Iranian Saviz vessel came as progress was reported on the first day of talks to revive American participation in the 2015 nuclear agreement between Iran and major world powers. Israel, which regards Iran as its most potent foe, strongly opposes a restoration of the agreement which was abandoned by the Trump administration three years ago. Commenting on the attack, the Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman Saeed Khatib Sadeh told reporters that the Saviz ship was struck by the blast at around 6 a.m. local time on Tuesday, April 5th, near the coast of Djibouti and sustained minor damage. No fatalities were caused by the incident and technical evaluations on how the incident occurred and its origins are still underway. The Iranian official emphasized that Tehran will take all the necessary measures regarding the case through international bodies. Rejecting media claims, Khatib Sadeh said that Saviz is not a military vessel whose specifications and mission have been formally registered with the International Maritime Organization. In a similar incident last month, an Iranian cargo ship was damaged after it was targeted by a terrorist attack en route to Europe in the Mediterranean Sea. Tehran said back then that such acts of terror are a clear example of naval piracy and run counter to international law and the safety of commercial vessels. Welcome to the Mid East Stream, I'm Marwa Osman. Iranian cargo vessel stationed in the Red Sea was damaged by an Israeli mine attack on Tuesday, April 6th, in an escalation of the shadowy neighbor skirmishing that has characterized Israel's animosity with Iran in recent years. The attack came as Iran and world powers sat down in Vienna for the first talks about the U.S. potentially rejoining Tehran's nuclear deal showing that challenges ahead do not rest merely in those negotiations. Now, to discuss this issue with us from California is Paul Larudi, former U.S. advisor in the Arabian Peninsula. Thank you very much for being with us, Paul, at such an early hour of the day. I really appreciate it. It seems that uh, the break uh, that Israel had taken during the Trump administration uh, for halting the nuclear deal came to an end when talks now are underway uh, in Vienna for the JCPOA. But now Israel seems more aggressive, uh, pushing for a conflict confrontation at any expense with uh, Iran by targeting the Iranian cargo vessel. How do you think this will play out if Israel continues with this, at least to say, reckless behavior? Well, uh, Israel wants confrontation. It's always shown it. It's part of its history. And, uh, and it's doing it again. Um, the, the result of this will be that Iran will uh, retaliate. And it has uh, shown that it will retaliate, for example, uh, with the assassination of General Qasem Soleimani uh, and, um, and the attack on the Ain al-Assad uh, uh, American base in, mm -hmm. inside Iraq. And um, uh, so, so this is likely to be the, what will happen. Of course, Iran will do so uh, proportionally. They, they have, that's what they did in the case of the assassination, and that's what they will do again. And, and it's, it's also the, uh, the way Hezbollah functions. So uh, there will be retaliation. Well, uh, Israel, which regards Iran as its most uh, maybe potent foe uh, in the region, uh, strongly opposes a restoration of any nuclear agreement with Iran. And the latest that we saw is the attack on Natanz uh, power plant as well. What does that have to do with Israel to begin with? I mean, how would an international agreement threaten Israel in any way? Well, from Iran's, uh, from uh, Israel's point of view, 
uh, the, the problem with the agreement is that it lifts the sanctions and Israel wants the sanctions to continue. It wants to harm uh, Iran as much as possible. It, uh, Iran is standing in the way of uh, Israeli expan expansion and, uh, and weakening uh, Israel's neighbors. Uh, because uh, a, a powerful nation like uh, like Iran can come to the aid of Israel's uh, neighbors. So th uh, this is part of the uh, Israeli general uh, general strategy of weakening its neighbors, and mm -hmm. it uh, it wants as much confrontation to exist, uh, whether from Israel directly or from the United States and uh, other countries. Uh, to 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 weaken uh, Iran, so well, th that's its object objective. But we did hear Tehran in the last time that there was such an attack on an Iranian vessel. It happened last month in March and on the uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea while the vessel was en route to Europe. But Tehran said at that time that such acts of terror are a clear example of naval piracy and run counter to all international uh, law on the safety of commercial vessels. Uh, reiterating that it will retaliate to these acts of aggression. What are the Iranian options here? Will it just become an eye for an eye in the open sea? Well, I, I think ultimately uh, it, there may be some of that, an eye for an eye. Um, and Israel has shown that it cares nothing for international law. I, it will behave the way it wants to. Uh, it needs it needs uh, some action, some retaliation, and uh, some disciplining. As, uh, for example, Hezbollah has shown. I mean, Hezbollah has been attacked. Uh, its its members have been killed, and it has retaliated and proportionally. And the result is that Israel becomes quiet because they know that Hezbollah has the power to do that. Well, it's the same thing with Iran. Uh, Israel has to learn that Iran's not going to take it and that the only discipline that they're going to get is a, an Iranian retaliation. So there may be a tit for tat, an eye for an eye uh, for, for some time, but I think ultimately Israel, uh, Israel will see uh, that this is useless and that it harms uh, Israel more than it harms Iran. Well, it seems that several regional files uh, are being put on hold waiting for the breakthrough talks of the JCPOA uh, and the return of possible diplomatic relations between Iran and the U.S., basically from Yemen to Lebanon to Syria and Iraq, and now the Israeli-Iranian uh, uh, feud. Are we exaggerating if we say the entire West of Asia it as, it is right now at a crossroad? If it's not right now at a crossroads, it soon will be um, with things going the way they are. In fact, uh, the sanctioned na nations are becoming uh, a kind of common market of sanctioned nations. They are helping each other. They are finding allies. Uh, Iran just signed a 25-year economic, big economic agreement, $400 billion with uh, with China and it's uh, and Russia also is is participating in this kind of uh, sanctions uh, common market. Even the European nations have have uh, kind of found another way to to get past the sanctions for certain purposes. Uh, so uh, the. Uh, things are changing. The the power of the uh, uh, the United States is is um, is extending its power beyond its means, and the result will be that the other nations will get together and find ways around it and to develop their own power power base. Uh, they need to do that because the the main threat is the United States. Well, wouldn't that bear the question of when that happens, wouldn't the United States go all out for a war to try and retake the position that it had lost? Um, it's, it's always possible, but uh, uh, the, I, I don't think the United uh, we can hope that the United States um, uh, population will resist that because the the, uh, the u.s population is being impoverished and 
uh, is without resources. More people are on the street. The homeless population is growing by leaps and bounds. And, uh, and to, be, to have this greater burden than they have now when, when uh, half of their entire national budget is going for defense, more than half, in fact. Um, the, I, I think it, it, the, the United States is reaching the limits of its capabilities, and we're watching a superpower decline. Mm -hmm. Well, it definitely is uh, something to look out for in West Asia, especially when Israel has uh, been very blatant about its attack on uh, whether the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran or other uh, allies of the Islamic Republic of Iran in the region, namely in Syria, Iraq, and in uh, South Lebanon. I want to thank you very much from California, Mr. Paul Larudi, former U.S. advisor in the Arabian Peninsula, for joining us to talk about this uh, shadowy naval war that's going on in our region. Now, please stay tuned because next we will be talking how Hezbollah is implementing the economic resistance in Lebanon. For over a year, there has been a severe economic and political crisis in Lebanon, whose end is not in sight. In view of this, the Lebanese resistance Hezbollah has made a series of moves aimed at helping any needy Lebanese population cope with the negative implications of the economic crisis. With shortages of goods and skyrocketing prices, Hezbollah has opened a chain of supermarkets selling inexpensive goods at subsidized prices that are about 30 to 50 percent lower than the market price. Hezbollah's response to the economic crisis in Lebanon in this following report. Since October 2019, there has been a severe financial, economic and political crisis in Lebanon whose end is not in sight. Underlying the crisis are fundamental problems, mainly firmly rooted corruption and a chronic state of political instability. Additional difficulties have been added to the fundamental problems. The COVID-19 crisis, the negative effects of U.S. sanctions on the Lebanese economy and banking system, the explosion of the port of Beirut, difficulties stemming from the global war on Syria, and the lack of external assistance due to Lebanon's failure to carry out the reforms required by the international community. These effects were reflected in a shortage of basic essential products like food, fuel, and medication, difficulties in the banking system, and even initial signs of weakened security. In view of this, Hezbollah has made a series of moves aimed at helping the Lebanese population cope with the negative implications of the economic crisis. As the Lebanese market suffers from shortages of goods and skyrocketing prices, Hezbollah has opened a chain of supermarkets called Al Nur Depot in southern Lebanon, South Beirut, and the Bekaa Valley. These supermarkets sell inexpensive goods at subsidized prices that are about 30 to 50 percent lower than the market prices. Payment is made through a special shopper's card called the Al Sajjad card, named after the fourth Shia Imam who attached great importance to mutual solidarity in society. A drug shortage in Lebanon also prompted Hezbollah to begin purchasing Syrian and Iranian inexpensive drugs and medical products. The medical products were distributed to Hezbollah's affiliated pharmacies to cover the shortage. A fuel shortage that has led to rising prices of fuel products and frequent power outages also prompted Hezbollah to purchase fuel products and supply fuel to gas stations in the resistance areas where the U.S. undeclared sanctions are leading to critical fuel shortages in gas stations. To help the Lebanese people overcome the severe economic crisis accompanied by currency collapse and insane increase in prices, Hezbollah has become the last resort for the Lebanese public to survive the worst economic crisis in the country's modern history. 
To discuss this issue with us from Beirut is Dr. Ibrahim Musawi, Lebanese Member of Parliament for the Loyalty to the Resistance Bloc. Hezbollah, thank you very much for being with us. Dr. Musawi, now, following the difficulties uh, caused by the economic crisis in Lebanon, Hezbollah's response was direct aid of its community by opening a chain of supermarkets in South Lebanon, in South Beirut, and in the Bekaa Valley. Uh, these supermarkets are selling inexpensive uh, goods at subsidized uh, prices, despite the fact that they are not subsidized goods, but with prices lower than 50% of the market uh, price. Why on earth would that call for any scrutiny or even frustration from anyone? Well, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss this. First of all, you're talking about a highly divided Lebanese society. You're talking about a kind of polarization between East and West, if you want to say, or between people who follow the uh, Western hegemonic powers, uh, namely the USA and other powers who support the tightening of the Western grip over the country and over the region and over the area, as we all know, and between others who are the supporters of their own country, their domestic genuine interest of the people and uh, the land, the liberators of the land, those who are deeply entrenched in their lands. This, this kind of division is going to be translated into positions of frustration from one uh, area uh, and from one uh, crowd, from one audience. And on the other hand, uh, it's a sigh of relief, it's a uh, hilarious and uh, uh, happiness uh, for the uh, faithfulness, for the loyalty, uh, for the attention, for the care from Hezbollah, from the resistance to the Lebanese people. I say the Lebanese people, yes, because uh, the Shia areas that you mentioned, they represent the uh, part of the Lebanese society. If we have the capability, we are starting to support in the most striking areas, and the areas that are under the uh, highest uh, uh, tightened pressure from the United States of America, and we all know that, and all the Lebanese know that. Uh, if our capabilities are enough, uh, we are going to extend this to whoever would accept it or would want it. Because, as I told you, this has been a source of uh, criticism mm -hmm. uh, from, from other sides. Uh, we don't care about it. We are talking about people who have uh, served their lives, who have sacrificed their blood, who have given everything to this a true path of resistance and uh, national nationalism. Well, uh, Dr. Uh, Musawi, the thing that uh, actually brought about a certain uh, kind of frustration, which I found odd, but we need to explain to the audience, which is the payments for these goods um, in the Hezbollah supermarkets, they are being made through a special uh, shopper's card called a Sajjad uh, card. It's the name uh, of the fourth Shia Imam, Zain al-Abidin, the son of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, who uh, attached great importance importance to mutual uh, solidarity in society that was his legacy. Uh, does that suggest uh, in, for any uh, uh, purpose that this card is strictly for the Shia of Lebanon? Absolutely not. I did tell, I did tell you this because uh, when we talk about the universality of the message of Islam, it's for everybody, anywhere, anyone who is in need. When we talk about Imam Sajjad, Imam Zain al-Abideen, we're talking about a uh, source of mercy, a source of uh, kindness and grace for all. And here we are talking especially on the, uh, on the eve of Shah Ramadan. May all of the prayers of Allah be upon all the believers and all the people. This is the month of mercy. We wanted to emulate uh, this great Imam who used to uh, have uh, the goods of the people, the, of the poor, of the orphans, uh, of, uh, the, of the needy. He used to uh, go from one place to another uh, carrying this over his back and not, uh, um, not, not showing himself during the nights and uh, during the days. He was like going there and they didn't know about him. It was until he, uh, he died that the people knew that he was the one who was sending the message. Of course, at the time, uh, the society was not that complicated. The houses were very few. If we, if we talk about 100 years ago or 200 years ago in the villages, everybody would know everybody. What about if you're talking about uh, 1,300 or 1,200 years ago? So this is the message that we wanted to send. It's not limited. It's not restricted. Uh, to these areas, uh, but it is the beginning, and hopefully we would be able to extend this to all, to everyone who is in need. 
Well, um, a fuel shortage that has led to rising prices of the fuel uh, products and uh, frequent power outages due to the bankruptcy of the Lebanese Central Bank, uh, which is a result of decades of corruption in Lebanon. Hezbollah has begun, uh, it has, uh, the party has begun purchasing uh, fuel products, especially diesel fuel, and supplying uh, fuel gas uh, to uh, fuel uh, oil to gas stations uh, that are not receiving any fuel from the government, especially in stations that happen to be in areas that support Hezbollah, which is basically undeclared U.S. sanctions against an entire population. This is basically collective punishment. But if the central bank is bankrupt, how come only the Shia communities are suffering from this fuel shortage? Well, actually, it's not only the fuel shortages in the Shia area. To tell you the truth, there are restrictions on the borders here and there. And there is another point that I want, I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately, when we talk about uh, uh, the merchants, the big merchants, those who have uh, the ability uh, to make any kind of restriction over the uh, fuel oil, over these goods, they want to keep them. So when the prices go up, they would make use of it. This is a big problem, actually. But to tell you the truth, Hezbollah, not Hezbollah, the Iranian uh, uh, side, the, the Iranian ambassador to Lebanon has made it very clear to the Lebanese, to the Lebanese government, everyone that Iran is ready to hand out the help for the Lebanese community and for the Lebanese government, for the Lebanese state to take the uh, fuel from Iran and they would use the Lebanese lira, the Lebanese pound. This this is an unprecedented and this would help in, uh, in um, easing and if you want and solving the problem of the fuel and this would like save a very important the and dear refused. money for the government. The, ref the government refused. They don't want to take this position. The, the same offer has been given about the electricity that Iran is ready to build uh, fields and uh, plants of electricity so it could be uh, uh, locally and domestically here in Lebanon generated not to take from any side mm -hmm. again it was refused so it is the general help for all of the Lebanese people some accepted other refused this is the problem again those who refused some of them because uh, they hate the acts the axis of resistance because they follow another completely different axis mm -hmm. and the other another uh, era or another Another area, uh, other people, they are afraid of more restrictions and more sanctions from the American side. We in this axis of resistance, we are going to do everything possible to help the Lebanese generally and our people particularly mm -hmm. to ease the situation over them, well, whether uh, it is, whether, less, whether it is for fuel minute, or whatever. Uh, unfortunately, Please. that's all the time that we have. Uh, we have one more minute, Dr. Musawi, but I want to talk about expanding the services of Al-Qard Al-Hassan Association just after the Again, financial yes. uh, collapse in Lebanon. Uh, I know that these plans are Hezbollah's ways of dealing with the economic downfall, but now they have their own chain of banks as well and also ATM machines. But doesn't that just fall in the validation of the notion of a state within a state? Absolutely not. I categorically deny and refuse this. To tell you the truth, the government is there and we want them. This is this is something when you talk, you're not talking about chain of banks or, or branches of banks. You're talking about ATMs. It is only restricted to this uh, charity groups called Qard Al Hassan. It mm -hmm. has been there. Qard Al Hassan has been there as an institution since more than 30 years. But yes, uh, truly, it has been expanded after the sanctions that has taken place because people want to put their money in a safe place that they can take it anytime they want, and they are not taking any kind of uh, interests uh, for mm -hmm. for having it there. This is something that has been, you know, when you put people at risk and they make it an opportunity. This is the menace that has been changed into an opportunity by Hezbollah, by the axis of the resistance, by the people who trust the resistance. Mm -hmm. This has uh, pushed many people, because they talked about Qard al-Hassan, many people uh, felt that it is their duty to go and uh, put their money there, because mm -hmm. it is safer than the uh, So it's basically uh, a matter one. of trust between the Lebanese people and absolutely. the resistance. I want to thank and you if very you ask, much. If you ask all of the experts, they tell you the number one issue in Lebanon is the trust. Exactly. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Ibrahim Moussaoui, Lebanese member of parliament for the loyalty to the resistance bloc. Hezbollah for being with us to talk about this very important issue, how Hezbollah is leading a, a, an economy of resistance in Lebanon. And thank you for watching. Please stay tuned next week for more from the Mideast stream.